So I'll be talking about arrays, um, and particularly beyond NumPy arrays. And where I'm coming from this, coming from in this, is uh, I'm part of an NSF program to uh, improve uh, software used by high energy physicists. So, uh, so that's my, my charge in all of this. That's where all of this is coming from and where it's motivated. But uh, I think that what we'll be talking about here is of uh, broader interest than that. However, uh, since it is the motivation for the problem, I should at least start by uh, uh, talking about what is it that we're doing. Um, and so you've probably seen pictures like this. Um, some people might have it like, <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, background near a laptop or a poster or something. Uh, it's, a, it's a photo of some atomic particles traveling through a detector. Um, and this one is from 1964. Uh, a group from Berkeley scanned through 100,000 photos to find this one. This one is special. Uh, it's the discovery of the, uh, the omega baryon, which was a pivotal point in uh, discovering quarks. Uh, so then, look at that. You see it? Go through 100,000 photos that look most, more or less like this in order to find it? Well, it helps if you draw the lines on top. Uh, so each one of these pictures has to be interpreted. So you see all those tracks on there. Most of them don't have to do with the event of interest. And then uh, it's a matter of finding the ones that do and interpreting it. And the interpretation is itself pretty complicated. This is uh, an omega, decays to a xi, decays to a lambda, decays to, uh, to photons and pions and protons. And, you know, uh, and you have to go through 100,000 to find these. Um, so, just in a nutshell, um, this is what particle physicists do. Even today, this is what we do. Uh, we uh, collide particles, uh, produce new ones, and take pictures of their decays so that we can interpret them as, you know, what, what have we produced. Uh, and unfortunately, these, these pictures come unlabeled. So, here's a modern one. You know, so you look at that and you say, oh, yeah, I see something, maybe. <laughs> So um, since you know, the old days, uh, uh, things have basically just scaled up. It's the same kind of problem, but um, going from photographs to digital scans, the number of events is now you know, at the trillion level. Um, obviously, we're no longer manual or semi-automated. It's fully automatic. Even machine learning is involved in that. And also, you know, the number of people involved is, is huge. Um, so, how do you algorithmically find decay, such as that, that chain we started with? Well, it involves loops. Um, you loop over all pairs of particle tracks, and you just tentatively uh, call them pi plus, pi minus. Just assume that they are. Um, calculate the, uh, uh, the special relativity mass that they would have if they came from a single uh, particle decay. And if that mass is close to a known mass, uh, they will pile up, you know, the ones that are truly that decay peak at the, known, at the true mass, and the ones that aren't, and they're just random junk, they're everywhere else. So, um, so that's it. You just do that all the way down the chain, such as, for instance, Higgs to ZZ, Z to EE, -E, or Z to Mu Mu. So uh, for the Higgs discovery um, six years ago. Uh, and then it shows up as a peak. Brand new peak. OK. So from a computational point of view, so that was the motivation. Now let's think about the computation. Uh, one of the great advantages we have is that all the events are independent. So no particles from one decay will uh, uh, live long enough to, uh, to be in the next decay, or at least it won't stay in the detector long enough. It'll fly away. Um, the detectors uh, produce collections of different uh, kinds of signals, uh, tracks like we've seen, but also energy dot positions, timing, and then you know when we partially analyze these, we put them in different buckets. These are the electrons, these are the muons, these are the something else. Uh, and each of these has a variable length collection, variable length per event. If we were to do this with SQL, and we don't, um, this is kind of the mindset that it would be. Uh, the decay candidates can be thought of as like a self-join if we're combining two things from the same collection, or like a cross-join if we're combining things from different collections. But here's the kicker. 
always on event ID 1 equals event ID 2. It's uh, always in the same event. And that's basically why we don't use SQL. We'd be saying that every single, with every single join. And then, after we found candidates, the good candidates are identified by filtering, throwing away the bad, or some sort of a reduction, like in the functional programming sense, uh, uh, to find the best of what remains, like maximum, sum, something like that. So here's sort of the diagram of how it goes. First, we'll have some sort of per event join. Uh, and then we map some calculation across all of those candidates. We filter to pick the best ones. No, to, we filter to find the OK ones. And then we reduce to find the best one, independently for each event. Uh, another key, um, can't say this enough, it's a large number of events. Um, and then each event within the event has an arbitrary number of record-like structures. So we'll have like a muon record that has values of you know, various uh, attributes, PTA to phi. Uh, and then we'll have several of them. Uh, and this is not re reducible to a single flat table without some sort of padding or loss. So if we tried to turn this into a single table, then we would have to say, oh, mu1 PT, mu2 PT. Uh, and if there isn't a mu2, well, then you fill it with NA. And if there is a mu3, well, you've lost it. So, so, this, so we don't want to do that lossy transformation until at maybe the very last stage of some particular analysis. Um, and then the programming landscape uh, is, um, I would say, rather conservative. It wasn't until the uh, late 90s, early 2000s that we switched from Fortran to C++. And only right now that we are starting to use uh, Python seriously. Uh, in fact, you can see this transition happening right now. I did some uh, GitHub statistics. I, I selected uh, users who are definitely physicists because they, they forked a particular repository. And then I looked at what are the languages of choice for their other repositories, the ones they didn't fork. And since physicists started using uh, GitHub in uh, 2013, and to a large degree, uh, it's slowly been transitioning from primarily C and C++ projects to now more Python and Jupyter. And this year is the, the turnover point. So uh, in our field, a conventional analysis means you write loops on objects uh, allocated on the heap in C++. Uh, and so this is what the, the finding the two pions to find the, the, the k-on looks like. It's just C++ loops. We fill STD vector and such. Um, a direct translation to Python would be a performance disaster. And in many cases, this is exactly what people do. And it is a performance disaster. Um, because you know, Python objects are uh, uh, doing a lot of string comparisons and such. Uh, so for high performance computing in, in, in Python, usually the first thing you think of is, well, we should use NumPy. Uh, NumPy, if you're not familiar, uh, is a library. It's very, it's almost, it's an almost standard library. Uh, uh, almost everything is, uh, uses it. If you've ever used or heard of Pandas, Pandas uses it heavily. Um, and the objects in the, in the Python world uh, are really just pointers to big buffers. And uh, the Python objects interpret those, those buffers as arrays. Uh, NumPy comes with a suite of operations that uh, apply to whole arrays. So if you want to do something like compute uh, PZ is PT times cinch of eta. Just, that's something that you might want to compute. You can put individual numbers in there. You can put one PT and one eta, you know, one number in each, and it'll compute that and give you one number back. Or you can give a whole array of PTs and a whole array of etas. It'll compute that and give you a whole array of PZ back. And that's where uh, you get the, the speed in Python, is that you're not doing very many Python statements, and you're not using very many Python objects. Most of the stuff is some compiled and probably vectorized loop in, in C. Another neat thing about Python is, sorry, another neat thing about NumPy is that uh, uh, the, the, the object that interprets the array can change, leaving the array in place without, without changing the array at all. So uh, just changing this uh, shape and strides parameter, you can do all sorts of crazy slices of these 
rectangular arrays without actually touching the data, the big data at least. But NumPy doesn't have anything for unequal length lists. And this is fundamental to our field. You know, it goes all the way back to the 60s. Uh, so we can't get away with it. We, we need something. Uh, we don't have anything in NumPy that could take uh, a whole lot of events, each with different sized collections, and do something like um, you know, find all the, all the pairs. There are libraries uh, that represent arrays of unequal lengths. This is becoming more and more popular. I've no noticed that there's uh, used to be just one library and then you know, there are more uh, uh, for being able to deal with this. And so this is a good sign. Um, and if you're thinking about this, and if you're thinking in terms of traditional data structures where you have like a C++ class or a, a struct, um, and then STD vectors of them. Um, uh, it can be surprising to find that you can take those objects and actually um, slice them the other way. Instead of making a bunch of objects this way, you just somehow slice them this way, if that makes any sense. Uh, so look at the, the diagram here. We can slice them in such a way that we can make an array that consists of just one field. Just all the values for that one field all the way across. And same thing for the next field and same thing for the next field. And this has lost all of the structure, which of those values belongs to which particle in which event. And so then you can have another array represent that structure. So for instance, you could have, I mean, the simplest thing to do would be to just have the account. And this count says, oh, the first three of those values belong in the first event. And the next one value belongs in the next event. And the next one value belongs in the next event. And then two values in the last event. That's nice, except it's not random access. So you can just cumulative sum it to, to get offsets. And then you can jump to any one that you want. Furthermore, that offsets is sort of folded together starting positions and stopping positions. And sometimes it's useful to separate those out and have two separate arrays for that. And sometimes it's useful to have, instead of pointers down from the parent to the child, pointers up from the child to the parent. And that, if, uh, if you're in the SQL world, uh, is a normalized table. It's like a normalized foreign key. It's useful for some operations. And others of these are useful for other operations. So uh, a lot of what these libraries do, and, a lot of, and what I just showed you, actually, is just representing uh, the jagged data um, in a columnar way. But now let's talk about manipulations. So we'll just start with a simple one just to, to illustrate uh, what kind of uh, power that we, that we have now that we didn't have with uh, non-columnar data. So let's say the thing that you want to do is you want to remove the first muon from each event, remove the first particle from each event. You just want to drop it and keep the rest. Well, if you have traditional data structures, that means you have to rewrite those lists. Um, but if you have a columnar data structure, particularly if it's like uh, starts and stops, you see that you didn't have to touch any of the, uh, the, the content. You can just change the number of where they begin for this particular operation. And then other operations do other tricks. But yeah, so we've got a whole bunch of new tricks available if we have the data represented this way. And a really nice thing about this is, what if the contents, what if uh, all of the attributes corresponding to my particle, let's say I have 100 of them, and a given physics analysis, this particular analyzer is going to touch at most 10 of them, and then that analyzer is going to touch a different 10. Well, you can, uh, if you additionally make uh, those content arrays lazy loading, then you can do all sorts of manipulations on your particles without even reading them from disk. So properties of columnar data, uh, I didn't prove it, but um, uh, these, they are fully composable. So you could, for instance, uh, say a, a jagged array's content is not just flat numbers, it's another jagged array. And you can keep doing that all the way down. Um, and you can do that in arbitrary, complex ways. In addition, you can do more than just jaggedness. Um, 
non other non-trivial data types like uh, uh, heterogeneous, you know, so you might be thinking like a tagged union, uh, nullable types, pointers. The one thing it has to be is it has to be statically typable. It can't be completely dynamic data. You have to know ahead of time what is the type. Uh, and most operations, beyond just the slicing example I showed, uh, can modify the structure, the structure arrays, so the counts or the offsets or the start stops or the parents, the, the, the things I showed you in red, without touching the underlying content. So Awkward Array is a library that does this. Uh, it uh, provides uh, operations on columnar data with a NumPy-like interface. So you could take, for instance, that monstrosity. So that, that data looks, looks terrible. It's got all sorts of nuns in it. It's uh, uh, one of these, the 4.4 and the bracket 5.5. It's, it's breaking pattern. Um, it has some, some tables in it that I'm representing with uh, uh, JSON-like uh, dictionaries. Uh, and you can ingest it into a columnar array. So following some uh, recursive rules, turn it into columns. Um, and then you can do NumPy-like things on it. You can, like, uh, if you're familiar with NumPy syntax, the way that you would slice the second but not first dimension of an array is you would put a colon for the first dimension and then, like, uh, minus two colon to, say, the last two of the, of the next dimension. And it'll just do that. You can verify that it's just picking the last two. Uh, and you can uh, apply uh, array at a time operations. Like you could take the cinch of everything, or you could add 100 to everything, or any of the, the NumPy ufuncs just pass down through these nested structures and apply at the lowest level. So I'm here, I'm showing the original uh, data structure with everything uh, uh, plus 100. The layout of this, uh, how, what is this actually in memory? It's a bunch of Python classes uh, that contain NumPy arrays. So, uh, so the depth of this structure, you can see jagged array, uh, uh, index max array for the masking, uh, union array for the heterogeneous lists, uh, all these different kinds of structures. But at the leaves, at the bottom of all this, it's just NumPy arrays. And that's, in that sense, it's columnar. And data types, uh, we want to be able to describe data types. So um, the way that we're, we're actually describing those data types is, is we say, well, you know, array indexing is like a function. You know, you have square brackets instead of round brackets, but you can put something in there. Uh, and if that's a number, then you get an, an element. If that's a string, then you can get a column from it. And so then uh, since, and then you can talk about the, the data type like a, a a functional data type. Like, this is intentionally made to look like a, a, a Haskell function data type of, of this arrow that, arrow that, arrow that, uh, to show what happens if you put in a, a number here, what kind of structure do you get? If you put in a number here, what kind of structure do you get? You get a, a tree in general. Um, and here's a point that is really an aside, but uh, I want to take advantage of my, my time at Strange Loop with, with people who know these things. Um, we've found that you know, arrays are functions in general, and array indexing is function composition. Uh, and in fact, it's associative, just like function composition. And that's been really useful in our work. If anyone can tell me more afterward about like, if there's any literature on this, I'd really like to know. This is just a sort of a thing that, that we discovered by, by tinkering with this. And I bet there's like, a mathematical theory of it and I want to learn. Anyway, that's an aside. It's way too much detail. <laughs> So let's get back to the main point. What kinds of things can you use this for? So let's look at some real data and some not particle physics data for a change. Um, completely far afield, somewhere, somewhere, you know, way, way out there, and let's consider, oh, space data. Uh, so look at the exoplanets data set. Uh, and I like this data set because it's naturally jagged. A star can have more than one planet. Uh, so we ingest that from a JSON file, because a JSON file is a rather natural way to represent these structures. Um, and let's look at just one of them, or two of them, I guess. And you can see that uh, among the, the, the fields in this data, uh, one of the fields is planets, which is a list of more objects. So this is, the, this is what the data means, but the data is in a columnar representation. Uh, 
this data type is easier to read than the, than the monstrosity I showed earlier. Um, if you put in a number less than 2,900 something, uh, you will get a star, and a star has all of those fields. And if you put in the field name for right ascension or distance or mass, you'll get the star's right ascension or distance or mass, and those are numbers. Or if you put in the, the string planets, you get a list of objects that have their own properties. So in well-behaved cases, not ridiculous cases, this is kind of readable. Um, some of the NumPy-ish things you might want to do, you might want to just select all the, the star masses because you're going to compute something. You might want to select all the planet masses. Now look at this. That's, that's a jagged array. It has nested structure. Some of these, like the, the second to last, has three items in it because there are three planets in the second to last in this data set. Uh, and we have sort of projected through the planet structure to pick out just the mass. So we look at the, the data types for this. The star type is rather simple. You put in an integer, you get a uh, nullable float. Um, some of them are none. You know, some of them are missing. Uh, you put in stars of planets of mass, and you get this jagged array of numbers. Um, you, you, you put in a, uh, a number less than 1,000. You put in a number, who knows, because it's jagged. Uh, and you get a nullable float. So this uh, uh, projection uh, slices through rows instead of, sli uh, sorry, slices through columns instead of slicing through rows, which is a very natural thing if it's rectangular tabular data, but you can also do it in a jagged case. And uh, another nice mathematical property of this is that this means that putting strings in square brackets and putting numbers in square brackets commute. You can switch the order of the strings and the numbers, you can't switch the order of a number and a number or a string and a string. So that's a neat property. It's, it's really natural if, if, you had a, if you had a rectangular table, you can specify the column before the row or the row before the column and you expect to get the same thing in each case. It generalizes to jagged cases. Uh, you, you can represent this data with pandas. So maybe, maybe somebody who's uh, really into data science and has been using pandas for everything would say, well, you know, I could probably represent this, this uh, 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 exoplanets data set in pandas. And yes, that's true. You could take the, uh, you could take the jaggedness that I had, in, you know, was representing by square brackets and put that into the index. So you see in this, the, we just turned it into a pandas uh, data frame. You can see that the, the, the second to last has three planets because there's, there's a, um, an entry and a sub-entry column at the left. Uh, and in fact, it has some, some nice properties. Um, jaggedness in the awkward arrays uh, goes to multi-index rows, and nested tables in the jagged array goes to multi-index columns. That's kind of neat. Why don't we just use pandas? Um, well, we often have to deal with uh, differently jagged collections. You know, we'll have um, two electrons and one muon, or you know, 15 jets, or you know, these different types of particles uh, in the same event. Um, and so, if we try to have my mouse here. Uh, differently jagged things, we can project out and get a table for each one, either one of them, but we can't get a table for both of them because uh, a data frame can have only one index. You can have, and if, so if we were trying to live in that world, we'd find that we would be uh, merging all the time. We'd be doing nothing but merging. There are other packages, as I said earlier, that uh, represent uh, uh, can represent jagged arrays, and in some cases, like Apache Arrow and XND, they have very complete type systems. Uh, XND even has pointers, which is nice. Um, and in fact, uh, our own software, uh, this root uh, package goes back to the, the late 90s when, when we were making the C++ transition, uh, and it represents all of the data as jagged columns on disk. So it's like we were almost, you know, we're almost there. Uh, but when it loads it into memory, it turns them into C++ objects. So here, we're just going one step further and uh, leaving them in that jagged form when they're in memory. 
Um, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm not, uh, with the awkward array package, we're not trying to replace those other packages. In fact, we want to be able to interact with them very well. We want to uh, transform back and forth to all these different formats. Uh, so our focus is not uh, uh, input, output, or even numerical math as it is in the case of XND. Uh, it's the structure manipulation that we have to deal with all the time. We couldn't, in fact, use any of those libraries as is. So some examples of this. I'm going to check time. Good. Um, this is the example I started with. Say you want to compute uh, masses of uh, particles like A goes to XY or B goes to XX. Traditionally, you have to write loops. Uh, and then the structure of those loops depends on whether you're picking from the same collection and you don't want duplicates or not. Uh, so as a um, array manipulation, now we have primitives for this, you know, because we're doing it all the time. We want to be able to say data set X cross data set Y to get the cross join per event. Or a data set X choose two to pick uh, uh, two without replacement. Um, and so, you know, I just replace them with function calls. Uh, those function calls are themselves uh, implemented with a bunch of NumPy tricks. So, um, not, not to study this deeply, uh, this is um, no point in here do we have like a for loop. It's all just NumPy, 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 NumPy. And even the, the choose thing, I'm just uh, flabbergasted that there was a, uh, 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 that there's a vectorized, you know, pure NumPy solution to it. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's limited by the fact that uh, algebraically you can't solve the quintic which I think is hilarious. Anyway, it's my favorite uh, software limitation. If we wanted to do a uh, uh, size bigger than five, we'd have to write loops. Um, other examples like filtering, I said that was the next step you want to do. Let's say we want to filter these particles. Well, now you have a choice. Do you want to remove particles from events or do you want to remove events? So there have to be different ways of expressing that. And with loops, there are different ways that you write that out, long-handed loops. Uh, and, and just as a byproduct of generalizing NumPy's rules, uh, we get these, these cute little expressions like, like this, where uh, you put a mask in square brackets, and that mask is made by, you know, greater than cut or dot max greater than cut. And, those, and the first one is cutting particles, and the second one's part cutting events for this reason. If you're familiar with NumPy, you've probably uh, made uh, arrays of Booleans and passed them inside the square brackets uh, to select uh, elements of the array. Uh, we can do that here, even if the elements of the array are, are, are variable length things. Uh, and we can also do that if we have a jagged mask and it has the, the natural extension. And in this case here where we said events a max greater than cut, that is a reduction, the maximum is reducing the jagged array to a flat array, and then it's a Boolean. There, um, uh, it, it comes out in a, in a nice way. Similarly, I think I'm going to hurry along now. Um, the, uh, the, the, part of the problem of reduction uh, is, is similarly made, uh, similarly simplified by the fact that we're just generalizing what NumPy already does to the jagged case. Um, physicists are, uh, come up with much harder problems than these. You know, these examples are, are deliberately simplified, uh, but this is an example problem statement, and you know, looking at a statement like this, I'm not even gonna read it, uh, um, makes us think that maybe we want uh, 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 domain-specific language. And so here's a, 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 an attempt at a SQL-like domain-specific language for trying to express some of these really complicated uh, uh, selections. But on the other hand, when you do that in loops, like the way people are doing it now, it's pages. And that's, you know, what currently makes research hard. Uh, this is not a hypothetical package or used by only a couple of people. We've been, uh, it's been sort of in the wild for a year now. Um, these are, are PIP download statistics, so we're tracking how people are using it. With the selection that they're on scientific Linux systems, which means that they are physicists. So just picking the physicists, 
just picking the physicists, um, uh, awkward is this purple line. Uh, when it was made a dependency of this red line. And so people are bringing in the, uh, the, the package to just read their files, and they're getting the, the awkward arrays along for the ride. Uh, but within this world, within this small world, um, uh, there's as many downloads of this as matplotlib or uh, uh, pandas. Uh, we now have a lot of these uh, composable things. We just compose them to get all sorts of different features. Uh, and what do we want to do now, now that we're you know, successful? Now we want to rewrite it all. <laughs> uh, now we've got a lot of feedback from the users. We, there's some design changes we want. We also want, uh, to, we want a C++ version of this so they can interface with existing code, a lot of which is written in C++. Uh, we want to be able to use Numba uh, because that would be fantastic if people could write Python expressions and just JIT compile them. And, uh, and, and, those, and those functions were aware of this stuff. Um, but you know, this, if, if we're imagining uh, writing three versions of this, one NumPy, one C++, one um, Numba, uh, it, it's beyond our, our abilities. So, uh, and we also want to fix some design mistakes that we're learning from people using and the feedback. And so we have an idea of building it in layers uh, with a, a, a substrate written in C where the actual algorithms go, and then C++ or Numba where you have memory management, and then that's PyBind 11 into Python. And so this is, these are our plans. This is what we're working on now. Uh, finally, like, is this only for particle physics? Um, I would say no, otherwise I wouldn't even come here and tell you about it. Uh, the existence of Arrow and XND uh, and the momentum behind these projects suggests that it's not. Um, so nested data structures, well, how could that be domain specific? Um, we have found another example, at least, uh, in the sciences where this join, map, filter, reduce uh, workflow is highly relevant uh, in genetics. And we found this out because we found out that Z-A-R-R, however you pronounce that, ZAR, the ZAR library uh, has ra ragged arrays, and the reason they need them is for genetics. Um, and then finally, you know, I've been looking at this uh, SIMD JSON package, which is awesome. It, parses uh, uh, JSON super fast. Uh, if we could couple this with the from iter and turn the JSON into columnar data, how many JSON data sets are there out there? You know, maybe log data or something like that, semi-regular, that you want to just ingest into a much smaller form and perform much faster operations on? So, I'll leave that out to you to, uh, <laughs> are there any ideas? And finally, um, uh, there are a lot of people are contributing to this. Um, we're getting uh, functions written by users, and, uh, and the, I've had a lot of great conversations with the, the Arrow and the XND team and the Czar team. Um, uh, so I want to acknowledge them. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs>